actually use, but it means deserving of praise and commendation. In the King James Version of the Bible, we find the word praise, not different forms of the word, but just the word praise in 216 verses, 192 times in the Old Testament and 24 in the New. So let's turn to our text today, Philippians 4, 8. <clears throat> Philippians 4, 8. And that actually is the text for all of the ladies' lessons this week. So it would be really easy to use, you know, the parts of the verse to do the lesson, but I can't do that or I would be stealing their lessons. So in Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So when we look at the words that just follow whatsoever in this list, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, have we ever stopped and considered that the things on which Paul tells us to think represent the characteristics of Christ? You know, true, honest, just, it, these are characteristics of Christ. Paul has given us a list of things to think on that are good and tells us to think on them, whatever has virtue or praise. Therefore, our thinking should be centered around the attributes of Christ. We need to focus our thoughts on anything that is deserving of praise, therefore praiseworthy thinking. Can we honestly say, and I dare say that we can't, that we just sit around and think of things that are praiseworthy? You know, do we spend our time during the day saying, what do I have to be thankful for? What is praiseworthy? Um, and I know we spend some time, but what do we spend the majority of our time doing? being overly concerned about things that possibly never even will happen, don't we? You know, what if, what if, what if? And you know, I think Paul knows that this is the tendency that we have, and he's reminding us, no, don't do that. Think on these things. These are the things that you think on, that you spend your time thinking about. So basically what we need to do is learn to redirect our focus and what we put into our mind. In the Gospel Advocate Commentary, in one of the New Testament commentaries, there's a quote, and it says, If there be any praise, he, as in Paul, does not intend that the Philippians should follow after, the carnal, after all that the carnal world might praise, but that they should devote themselves to the performance of good works. And in thinking about that, it reminded me of Colossians 3.2 which says, set your affection or your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. We are to set or place our minds on things that are spiritual, not on things of the earth. And when you think of set, I've heard it explained like this and it just kind of clicked and made sense, but it's like how concrete sets. You know, when you pour it, you can move it around, you can spread it out, but once it dries or it sets, it's fixed, it's there. So we need to set, fit, fix and focus our minds on things that are above. And then we don't have as much room for the worldly things, do we? If we fill in our minds with the good, then we don't have as much place in our thoughts for the bad. By thinking on things that are praiseworthy, we're glorifying God and obeying his commands. John 14, 15 tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. So in thinking about this study, point number one is gonna be God is praiseworthy. You know, that should be the first and foremost of our thinking. If we're thinking about whatever is praiseworthy, God, number one, is praiseworthy. He is our creator, and he has provided a way for our salvation, which should compel us to desire to praise him. He has given us everything that we need to, that pertains to life and godliness. In 2 Peter 1.3, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, where? In heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. Psalm 145, 2 and 3 says, Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. 
we can never measure the greatness of God, which shows how worthy of praise that he is. We can't even measure his greatness. The author C.S. Lewis wrote, I think we delight to praise that we, what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is appointed consummation. If it were possible for a created soul fully to appreciate, that is to love and delight in the worthiest object of all and simultaneously at every moment to give this delight perfect expression, then that soul would be in supreme blessedness. To praise God fully, we must suppose ourselves to be in perfect love with God. If we don't love him, we're not truly going to praise him. And he goes on to say, our joy is no more separable from the praise in which it liberates and utters itself than the brightness of a mirror receives is inseparable, is separable from the brightness it sheds. We are to mirror the brightness and the glory of God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So anytime that we're discussing a subject, we need to do what? Look at the Bible and look at our biblical examples. Well, we have lots of biblical examples of people that show praise to God. In Judges 5, we have Deborah and Barak. They sang praising the Lord for the avenging of Israel and giving them the victory against Jabin, the king of Canaan. In Ezra 3, the, Lot, the Levites praised and gave thanks to the Lord after the foundation of the temple had been laid. David said that he would praise the Lord according to his righteousness and sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High, Psalm 7, 17. And this one, this is one that we even sing, Psalm 8, 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. In Psalm 9, he uses the word praise three different times in that chapter. In verse 1, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. In verse 2, I will sing thy praise to thy name, O thou most high. And in verse 11, sing praises to the Lord. Psalm 56 talks about praising his word in verses 4 and 10. And praise and adoration go hand in hand with showing our gratitude or our thankfulness. You know, even go back and think about Noah. What was the first thing that he did? He built an altar and he praised God, he worshiped God, he, shut, he offered the burnt offerings, and we know that that was pleasing to God, according to Genesis 8. And what about Hannah, when she poured out her heart because she wanted a son so bad? Did she forget to praise God and thank him for that son once she received him? No, she didn't. She prayed, she thanked the Lord for her son, and what happened? He blessed her above and beyond. She only asked for Samuel, but she received three more sons and two daughters. What did the children of Israel do after they believed that the Lord had looked down on their affliction? They bowed their heads and they worshiped. Exodus 4, 29 to 31. And what about Zacharias after the Lord loosed his tongue? He spoke and he praised God, Luke 2. We have looked at so many biblical examples of the people who praise God after something good happened. But are these the only type of examples that we have of praise in the Bible? It's not. Let's look at Job 1. Job chapter 1. In verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So here's Job. He's a good man. And what happens? Satan's going to and fro, looking for someone. And the Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job? So what happened? Satan did consider his servant Job. And he did what? He took away his livestock. He took away his servants. He took away his children. You know, we can read in verses 14 through 19, and it's while he was yet speaking, while he was yet speaking, it was one thing right after another. It was a continual thing. But what happened? Let's look at verses 20 through 22. 
Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Thither the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, could we do that? You know, I think so many times we just read through the Bible, and we don't really stop and think about this. I mean, here he is. He's lost his livestock, his livelihood. He's lost his servants, and he's lost his children. He has his wife still, but he's lost everything else. And he worshiped God. You know, how does this apply to us today? What do we do? You know, do we remember to show God thankfulness in the good times? You know, that's when it's easy, but sometimes we even then forget to praise him and thank him for what he's done for us. But when we go through trials and tribulations, do we remember to worship and to praise God? How many people just turn their back on God when bad things happen? They blame him for what happened. And we've got to remember, you know, we live in this world and things are going to happen. But God is always on our side and he is always going to see us through. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We can definitely see that God is praiseworthy of our praise and that we're commanded to praise him. So we talked about God is praiseworthy. When we think of whatever is praiseworthy, God is number one. But what a what are ways that we can show him praise? How do we show him praise today? We show him praise through our worship. So our second point is our worship should show praise to God. After all, the purpose of worship is what? It's to praise him. What does John 4, 23 and 24 say? It says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers so I worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We know that he is the object or he is the focus of our worship. But sometimes we forget that too, don't we? There's a story that's told of a man who was coming out of worship assembly on Sunday. And you know how you shake the preacher's hand as you're walking out. And he said, I didn't like those songs that were chosen today. And you know what the preacher said? That's okay. We weren't singing them for you. <laughs> you know, that may be a little blunt, but it's a very good point. We sometimes think that the worship services are just for us. But we aren't spectators attending a show are we? We, when we assemble to worship, there's only one audience, and that is God. We are there to praise and show honor to Him. We receive blessings from that, don't we? But in, in that being said, in New Testament worship, of course, it's comprised of many different actions, and we're going to talk about those briefly. Of course, one way that we show praise in worship is through our prayer. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. God wants us to pray to him, both in the worship assembly and privately. But let's stop for a minute and think. In the worship assembly, when we are being led in prayer, what's it easy to do? Just to kind of let our minds wander. It's not what we're supposed to be doing, is it? We are supposed to be praying with the one leading us in prayer, focusing on what they're saying, and praying along with them. Um, and do we even stop and think about what a privilege it is to be able to pray? I mean, that's one of our spiritual blessings, isn't it? Being able to talk to God, to know that he's always there for us. Um, what greater comfort than we, can we have than knowing that our creator 
wants us to talk to him every day. That he's never too busy for us. He always has time for us. And so let's not take advantage of that. Or let's take advantage of it and not negate our responsibilities. Pray along with whoever is leading our prayer. Another way that we worship him is in song. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 When we sing praises, do we think about the words that we're singing? If we're teaching and admonishing one another, should we not make sure that what we're singing is in accordance with God's word? We should, shouldn't we? We don't sing songs just because we always have or because we like the way it sounds. We sing them because we are teaching and admonishing one another. And what about those of us who tend to like just not even sing because maybe we don't sound as pretty as the person next to us? You know, there again, we're forgetting why we're there. We're forgetting why we're singing. It's not about what sounds good to us. It's about what is pleasing to God. We know that we sound good to Him because we're obeying Him. And we have to remember that. It is, you know, yes, we all like to sound good, but we're not all, we don't all have the same talents. We don't all sound the same. And it's okay because to God, it all sounds beautiful. Ephesians 5 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make a melody in your heart to the Lord. And we sing this as well. There's so many scriptures that we actually sing. And 2 Samuel 22, 4 is one. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 95, 1. So we praise the Lord in prayer. We praise Him in song. And we also praise him in our worship by partaking of the Lord's Supper as commanded on the first day of the week in Acts 27. There's a book that um, I referenced some in my study, We Bow Down, Women Look at Worship, and the chapter on the Lord's Supper was written by Cindy Colley. And she says, this verse strongly implies that the purpose for which they had come together on that particular day was to partake of the Lord's Supper. Since this is the only biblical reference to the time of their partaking, we can be assured that we are pleasing the Father if we partake each first day of the week. There, you know, you've always heard there's a first day of the week every week, and there is. And that's the time that we set aside to remember his death. Um, there's other scriptures that talk about the Lord's Supper, Luke 22, 19 and 20, Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And we have to remember we're not praising him if we're merely going through the motions. As we partake of each element of the Lord's Supper, we're to remember his body. We are to remember his blood to show his death till he comes, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 John 2.2 2 reminds us, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He died for the sins of the whole world. He was willing to hang on that cross. And sometimes, you know, we can't even sit there for a few minutes and focus on that. And it is. It's easy to, you know, somebody gets up and goes out. It distracts you and, you know, whatever. But, you know, sometimes I just have to sit there and kind of poke myself and just, okay, this is what I'm focusing on. This is what I'm thinking about. So whatever works for you, just, you know, to make sure that during that time you're focusing on what you should be. So praying, singing, the Lord's Supper, and of course another part of our worship is giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as, he hath as God hath prospered him, and there be no gatherings when I come. And of course 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man is, as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not gradually or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Do we purpose ahead of time? Do we plan or do we just kind of reach into our purse and, oh, this is what I have today. This is what I'll give. Is that purposing? Is that planning ahead? It's not. 
you know, we should not ever be guilty of giving God our leftovers. Um, you know, it's all His anyway, right? We are just merely stewards. Um, the same book I referenced earlier, We Bow Down, Gloria Ingram wrote the chapter on giving, and she said, To purpose is to plan what you will give back to God. We each know in our hearts how much we have been blessed by a loving Father. In reality, we and all we possess belong to Him. The question is not how little may we give, but how much can we give? So we have to remember, it's not about holding on, it's about letting go. It's all His anyway, and we are to purpose and plan ahead of time and give back to Him. So the last thing that we're going to talk about as far as our worship is preaching and teaching. Of course, we know on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Peter along with the 11 apostles preached, and we know that the Jews who heard them were pricked in their hearts, and there were about 3,000 who were added to the church that day. 1 John 2, 3 tells us, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments, but we're only going to know his will by spending time in his word. Romans 10, 17 so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If we don't hear his word, if we don't study his word, we're not going to know his word. We're not going to know his commands. Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Truthfortheworld.org had an article on the worship of the Church of Christ. And this is what they said. God has commanded us to teach his word, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Both saved and sinners need to be taught. Therefore, a lesson from the Bible is one of the acts of worship in which Christians are to engage, Acts 2, 42. We must learn God's word so that we can grow stronger in Christ, teach others, and overcome false teachings. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 2, 2 Peter 2, 2, and 2 Peter 4, 1 through 5. This is a very important part of worship and must never be overlooked. And we know, like we've, we've talked about prayer, singing, giving, the Lord's Supper, and preaching. So he has given us his commandments. He's given us the right way to worship him. But doesn't that mean there's a wrong way too? Jesus made it clear that worship can be in vain. Matthew 15, 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. We also receive a very strong warning in the following verses in Galatians 1, 8, and 9 about preaching something other than God's word. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than ye have received, let him be accursed accursed. Therefore, our worship must be proper. It must be how God commanded. It must be praiseworthy to God. So we've talked about God is praiseworthy. We've talked about how we praise God in our worship. Is there another way that we can praise God? We can praise Him through our actions, can't we? By following His commandments, by doing His good works. Um, so point number three, our action should show praise to God. We know that faith alone is not pleasing unto God, because even the devils believe and tremble, James 2, 19. But obedient faith displayed through our actions is a way that we can show our praise to God. We should be thinking on things that are praiseworthy and incorporating those thoughts into action into our lives every day. Don Iverson said in Paul's epistle to the Philippians, Again, Paul did not intend to question whether or not there are things worthy of praise within the church. Such is obvious. He wrote this way for the sake of emphasis. Should we praise, should we give praise to men for their praiseworthy works? Not in the manner that we praise God. God and God alone is worthy of praise in the sense of reverence and adoration. The original language suggests praise in the style of commendation or appropriation, that which is approved. We should approve honorable things as much as God approves. So, you know, the actions that we do, they're not for our glory, they're not for our praise, but they're so that others can see God through us. 
one way to incorporate Philippians 4 8 into our lives is just by that, filling our lives in service to God and to others. You know, Matthew 5 16 tells us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not us, but our Father which is in heaven. Good works are defined as those works that are kind, excellent, or fit that we perform. Sec, uh, I'm sorry, Timoth Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and pure him unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now, when I thought about that, you think about peculiar people zealous of good works. It makes me think of a group of people who are eager to do good works simply because they have the opportunity to show Christ in them. We can always find ways to help or encourage others. You know, there's so many things we can do. You think about the day where we get so much junk mail and bills. Isn't it nice to go to your mailbox and actually get a card and to know that someone took the time to handwrite you a card? Now, I know today so many of us just will send a quick text or something, and that's great because that is a quick way to let somebody know, hey, I'm thinking of you today. I'm praying for you today. As a matter of fact, I got some of those this morning, and I was very thankful for those. But that handwritten card, you know, let's not get away from that. Just to know that someone has taken the time and they've truly thought about you and, and, and want to um, let you know that they're thinking of you. And what about phone calls? There again, we text so much. Do we actually call people? You know, I can't help but sit and think about some of the people who live by themselves. And they sit there all day long and may not ever even talk to anybody. And, you know, how much they would appreciate just a phone call, even if it's five minutes, just, hey, I'm thinking of you. How are you doing? Can I do anything for you? There is um, a lady and Miss Roberta from Crossville knows who I'm talking about, but Miss Regina Browning is so extremely special to me, and she's like a mother, and she is in her 80s, and um, she has cancer, and she's been struggling for a long time. I'm trying not to do that. Anyway, um, so she had been in the hospital. She had found out that it had spread to her brain, and she had to have radiation. And I would text her back and forth because I was trying to be respectful. Her daughters were there. I didn't want to bother them. But I needed to hear from her. And so after about two weeks, I'm like, I can't do this. I just need to hear her voice. You know, I just need to talk to her. So sometimes we just need to talk to people, you know, and, um, and not always do the texting, but let's do some talking too. And it was great to be able to do that. And, um, you know, it didn't give me peace because she sounded so weak, but it, it just gave me peace that I'd actually got to have that time to talk to her. Um, and what about visiting? You know, we're all so busy. It's hard to find that time just to go visit someone. But aren't you the one that's blessed from that? I know... Um, when my husband and I first got married, we would go with the preacher and his wife on Monday nights to go visiting. And it's like, oh, wow, Mondays, you know, that's the hard day. But it always was a blessing to me. It, I was more uplifted. I wasn't so tired from work anymore. I just, I felt blessed. Uh, and, and there again, you know, especially the people who are there by themselves. I mean, they just, they love for you to come sit with them. And, there's a lady, um, actually we're at East Main, not West Main, but there is a lady in the congregation that um, is homebound and she's in her 90s and I went with, actually with one of the widow ladies to visit her and she said, now usually when I go see her, I stay all afternoon. <laughs> and so every time we get ready to leave, she would say, now y'all aren't ready to go yet, are you? They love that, and that's a good work. And, you know, it, it helps us. You know, we are, as younger ladies, to learn from the elders, older ladies, and if we don't spend time with them, we're never going to learn. Um, so that's another good work that strengthens and builds relationships. Um, and I, I know 
because like I said, we are all busy. Sometimes we get overwhelmed. We like we have to be involved in everything, don't we? You know, or we're just not doing our part. And we have to remember we're not super moms and we're not super women. But that doesn't excuse us from doing good works because we know that we do have to do good works to be pleasing to God. Ephesians 2.10. But maybe we just need to prioritize and say, okay, this is my season in life. What can I do? You know, if you're raising your children, incorporate what you can, you know, help your, get your kids to draw a picture on a card that you're sending to someone or, or whatever it may be. But there's always something we can do. And where we are now, they have what they call a community outreach program. And there's a lady there that's kind of over that and she will go and buy things and, and just have everything all there at the church building. And we'll meet on Wednesday nights like 30 minutes early. And I am not kidding you, in five to 10 minutes, everything's done. We've gone through our assembly line and everything's packed up and ready to go. And that's one way for us to all be involved. And, you know, I just, I have told her over and again how much I appreciate her doing that because she puts in a lot of work, but yet we're all able to help in some way. And it's not all on her, but, you know, there again, we're working together. We're working as members of the Lord's church to do good in the community. I do like a ladies' um, fellowship once a month. And we've been doing devos for those and, and different things. Well, the month that I talked about good works, I said, okay, what can we do? So I came up with the idea that we're, we're going to do cards, which, you know, that's a simple thing. But I'll get the list, you know, that the secretary puts out with all the names on them, and I'll cut them up, and I'll put them in a Ziploc bag, and then I'll have another bag full of cards. <laughs> So there's no excuses, you know, here you go. You get your name, you get your card, you write it out, you leave it on the table and the church secretary mails it, you know. And that's just one way that it helps me to be more diligent to send cards and we're just kind of helping each other, you know. We're working together, doing good works. Um, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work, John 9, 4. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This reverse reminds us that we are to abound in the work of the Lord. And we are to remember it is for His glory, not our own. Do we realize how much our attendance and worship helps others, how much that's an example to others. You know, the lady that's always there, and if she's not there, you better go look for her because there's something that's wrong. You know, let's all be that person. Um, not just to check our card that we're there, but because we love the Lord and we love His church and we want to be there and worship and help each other. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. How are we going to provoke one another if we're not there? We're not. Uh, and, and in saying that, I want us to think about something too. Look for that person that's not there, you know? And check on them. Don't just say they're not there. Check on them. That was another thing we've kind of incorporated is we'll get a list of like four families and I'll give it out to the ladies. Okay, this is your families for the month. Then you look out for these people. And if they're not there, you call and check on them. Because there's always those people in the congregation are kind of the invisible ones. And they don't have family there. And they don't have close friends. And they kind of come in at the end, you know, right before services start and leave early. And you know, then, well, maybe they're not there for a while, and it's been three months, and, oh, what happened to so-and-so? So, you know, let's do our part. Let's provoke one another. Let's look out for each other. Um, I know that my life has truly been blessed by the examples and relationship of so many of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I can't even begin to name, you know, all the people that have uh, influenced my family's life. I love that my kids are comfortable with preachers and preachers' wives, and you know they just 
they're best friends with these guys, you know, and they look at them as their grandpas. And that's a blessing to our family that these are, are people that my children can look up to and not just the preachers, but so many of the members. Uh, there, there's just so many that have influenced us. And there again, if you're not there, if you're not getting to know one another, you're not going to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. So let's try to look for opportunities to help others. And let's remember that we are servants in God's kingdom. In conclusion, I hope that we have learned from this study about a lot of things that are encompassed in this whatever is praiseworthy that we know that God is worthy of praise. We praise him through our worship. We praise him through our good works. We need to put off thinking that's not praiseworthy, all those bad things that we worry about that never happened, that we're not supposed to be worrying about. And that we need to redirect our mind and fill it with scripture, with pure thoughts, put on thankworthy thinking. And if we'll go and read the rest of Philippians 4, we can see that praiseworthy thinking will help us to avoid worry, self-pity, pride, and discontentment. So let's commit to ourselves and to God to be praiseworthy thinkers every day and not get to the end of our lives and look back and say, I wished I had done more to praise God. I want to close today with this poem that I found on comefillyourcup.com. It's written by June Smith, and I just thought it really fit with what we were talking about today. It, the title is God is Worthy of Praise. When you come to the end of the day and you bow your head to pray, you thank the Lord for his watching care and for the goodness he did share. You know that it was he who stood by your side when the ways of life were at high tide. You thank him and praise his name. You know without him life wouldn't be the same. Your life, your love, your trust you fully give when day by day with him you live. No one is greater and more worthy than he. To serve him is the best you can be. He is your protector, counselor, and friend, and you give him your pledge. You give your pledge to serve him to the end. You know deep in your heart for all your days he is worthy of your devotion and your praise. So let's all strive to focus on whatever is praiseworthy. Thank you.